We've come into this temple to give him praise. We came in here to give him glory and honor. We came in here to magnify his name. We come in here to reverence him. We come in here to magnify him. We've come in this place that we can have an experience with the king, the king of glory. And if you come in this place just to have that intimate time with your father for everything that he's done, and everything he's brought us through. He is deserving of the praise and the glory and the honor. He is worthy all by himself. The word says as they released it in the atmosphere, the king of glory, 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 that when I come into this place, I don't come into this place to leave the same way that I've came in, but I've come in this place that I may commune with the one that woke me up this morning, that I may be able to lay aside every weight, that I may be able to go to that secret place with him where it's just me and him and him and I and nobody else has anything to do with it, but when I come into this place, into this temple. He said, am I known in this place? Am I known? Am my presence? Is my presence known in this place? Or is it cold? Or is it hot? Or is it lukewarm? But is, am I known in this place? That when you come into a place that we have created as a sanctuary, we said that this is the place of Bethel. This is the place where he lives. So if this is the place where our father lives, I ask of you just give him 30 seconds to let him know that the king of glory, you are welcome in this place. King of glory, we can't do it without you. We can't praise without you. We can't sing without you. We can't breathe without you. We can't lift our hands without you. My God, we cannot see without you. We cannot hear without you. You are the king of glory in this place. And God, we came to see you. You are known. You've asked all much. Am I known? Am I known in your praise and in your worship? Am I known in your mind and in your heart? Am I known done enough to be known in our lives? Have I done enough that I deserve your praise and your worship? Am I known enough that you can sit aside just a moment just to love on me? Because I love you. We serve a father that loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He loves me. 
me. He loves you. He loves us. And he wants to know, am I known? Am I known? Do you know me? Do you know me? Do you know me? And as we're getting ready to close this series of Am I Known? My key verse that I'm going to focus in on is Exodus 33 and 16. Hallelujah. If you could just get it on the screen. It says, could you give me the NIV version, please? How would anyone know that you are pleased with me? And with your people, unless you go with us. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You may have your seats. This is what Moses was asking God as they were out in the wilderness. Moses made a declaration that he, he wanted to know that if your presence don't go with me, how would people know? How would they distinguish us from them? How does the world know that we are children of the Most High God if we look just like them? So Moses asked the question to our Father, that how would they even know that you're pleased with me unless your presence goes before me? And that was a question that I had to ask myself. How would they know that God's presence is with me if I look just like everybody else? How would I know if he's actually pleased with me? Because that one thing that he said, please with me, it helped me understand that I had to be, and I have to be in right relationship with him in order for his presence even to go. Because he says that the please with me shows me that you are or your presence is with me. And I say, okay, let me go ahead and let's go into the wilderness. Let's talk about the Israelite in the wilderness. And our, and our topic this month is, am I known? So if we open the story of Moses and the Pumpanites in the wilderness, that's us. So I'm going to insert us in this, in this text of the wilderness. It provided a baseline for us to let us know that while we're in the wilderness, there is something that will take place. And going through a wilderness season, things begin to happen. One thing we can all attest to what a wilderness season, you either going to know God, you either going to find out about God, or you're going to die of wherever you are in that place of your wilderness season. And he asked the question, am I known? For many of us, not saying that everybody has a different point in the wilderness where they're fighting in. Some of us, it may be spiritually. Some of us may be mentally. Some of us may be what our health physically. Some of us may be financially. But I guarantee you all of us can attest that in one of those areas, it has had a seat at our table at one point in our lives. That we had to really stop and think and ask the question, is God really known in this situation in my life? 
can I attest to him being whomever he said that he can be in those areas of our lives? And God asks the question, in order for me to be known, there has to have been a relationship that had to be built. There's no way that I say I know you or I know of you and I do not have a relationship with you. Some people are known of, but there's something that happens when you have a relationship with the person that's asking, am I known? Why? Because you know certain characteristics. You know certain things they would do. You know certain things they would say. You know their habits. You know their likes and their dislikes. And all that comes into a relationship. And I say, okay, God, exactly what is it that you were really, really wanting us to know when it comes out to say, am I known? He said, some of you know of me, but you do not know me. And I was like, why would you say that? He said, because some of us, we have to go through the wilderness with different experiences to know him in a way that we may have never experienced him before. This is why he took me to the story of them coming out of Egypt. So if anybody knows, this is a long book. Exodus is a very long book. And if you know anything about this story, I'm just going to give you an overview for those that may not know how the Israelites came out of Exodus. They exit out of Egypt. There were some key events that took place as they were getting ready to come out of Egypt, all right? So what it was saying that said God spoke through Moses through a burning bush. Everybody heard about that story, about that portion of the story that God spoke through Moses through the burning bush and he commanded everybody to get out of Egypt, all right? So Moses and Aaron, they confronted, they confronted Pharaoh and demand him to release the Israelites. And so guess what? Pharaoh refused. When he refused, there was a series of things that took place. So God went on hand and he sent the plague upon Egypt. He turned the Nile River into blood. There was frogs, lights, flies, disease and livestock, boils, hells, everything, locusts. All of these different events occurred as they were getting ready to exodus, all right, Egypt. Then the final plague that took took everybody by storm is when God um, required all the firstborns to be to die. So when all the firstborns died, Pharaoh finally agreed to let the Israelites but it's just so amazing that how many different events that took place prior to them exiting out of a place that held them hostage. There are many events that will take place for many of us before we actually get into our promised land. And in that time or in that season, do you guys not know that God was being known right in that moment and the people did not even recognize? They did not recognize that the hand of God was actually being released in that moment with all those different signs because they were so stuck into I just need to get out that they didn't recognize that God was blessing them even in their place of captivity. How many of us can be being blessed even in a place of captivity but we are so um, so dependent or we are so anxious to get into the place that looked like milk and honey and not realizing that he's actually prepping us in a place that can be hostility for us. I said, okay, how do we, we go from there? He said that he began, <clears throat> he told the Israelites to leave Egypt in a hurry. So they collected all their flocks and their herbs and they collected all of their stuff with them. And they read through the Red Sea and then Pharaoh said, hold on. We got to go get our people. So he went and all his people went through the Red Sea. God closed it up. So we know the story. Now they're out in the wilderness. 
He's brought them out of a place of captivity and he's taken them to a place that is freedom in a way of them going to their promised land. But how many of you guys know that when he takes you out of one place, if you do not deliver yourself from the things, the mindsets, the behavior, the characteristics of the place that you was once in captivity, once he take you to a place of freedom, you bring all of that stuff with you. With you and that's exactly what the Israelites did every single thing that God had delivered them out they did not recognize they did not understand but soon as he put them into a temporary state because the wilderness was supposed to be a temporary state they brought every single thing from captivity into a temporary state. How do we know that? When they got out in the wilderness, did not God provide for them while they were in captivity? And they get in the wilderness and then they begin to complain saying that you could have left us right back in captivity. Why would you bring us out here to die? And God is saying, if I kept you in captivity why wouldn't I be able to keep you in a place of freedom and that is because majority of us we bring over into our place of freedom every single thing that had us captive and why do we do that because it became our norm it became a comfort place. It became a place that I am familiar with. And I was when I was like, God, why would he use this scripture? And we've all heard it before in Matthews 9 and 17. He said that we don't put new wine into old wine skin. You, you know that scripture? He said, neither do, neither do people pour new wine into old wine skin. If they do, the skin will burst and the wine will run out and the wine skin will be worn that we are are only to pour new wine and new wine skin to preserve it. You know why he's saying that? Because in the old, they, when wine was getting ready to be fermented, they would use goat skin or any type of skin of an animal. And whenever the wine will go into the skin, as it form, fermented, it began to stretch. In order for the skin to stretch and not for it to burst, it has to be new. You cannot not put old stuff into new stuff and expect for it to stretch to the ability what it needs to do. This is what happens to the body of Christ. If he bring me out from the world, right? Now I have become a new creation. All things have passed away but I'm asking him to put new wine into the old me and as the new wine begin to form it it bursts. So now you got get all of the old stuff, my old behaviors, my old attitude, my old ways into a new place. He said the whole purpose of me saying that the old has passed away so now that I am able to put the new into the newness of who you are but if you get to a point where I just want to stay with the old this is why we cannot come to a place of full completion why because our wine skin has holes in it and it's leaking and it cannot hold or contain the anointing of our God I say, okay, God, he said, that is why I'm asking you, don't look for what we look for when we was in Lotta Hill. Because I'm guilty of it. God, I want what I got when I came in Pompano where we was only room to stand on the wall and all the men had to get out of their seats so everybody can sit. He said, am I not the same God? So what I did over there, can I not do here? But you're asking me for something old and I want you to realize that you're in something new. Uh -huh. 
I said, okay. He said, because a majority of us, we are in captivity from what's across the street, and we have not come into the new. He's brought us. Literally, that was our wilderness place of Egypt. We walk into the promised land, and now we're walking around circles because we're asking him to do something that is old. Right. I said, okay. He said, now, it's time for you guys to realize that in the wilderness, my presence is there. But because you haven't come to a place of acknowledging that I am who I am, then this is the cycle that we go through. Like, we don't have a hit and miss with God's presence. He's not a God where he hits and miss anything. That if he is known in here, there should be an experience every single time we enter into the presence of God. There should not be a moment where we we are looking for someone that is supposed to habitate the presence of this place. I said, okay, God, teach us. Teach us how to get to this place. He said, Tila, how many miracles do I have to prove to you to be your God? How, how, how many healings do I have to do? How many deliverance? How much grace and how much mercy do I have to prove to myself to know, to, for you to know that I am your God? How many times do I have to go through this with you? He was talking to me because believe you or not, every time we get these message God is doing an eye awakener for ourselves it's not for you at this was for me because he's asking the question of me am I known or am I known only when you need me to be known in your life can I be known in the promised land can I be known in the wilderness can I be known to distress can I be known when you're happy when you're sad can I be known when you're going through am I known but is it just for that present of that moment am I known in your life so he begins to give a checkup to the ones that's getting ready to deliver the message, right? And he says that I need you to have an understanding that before you can tell anybody else about me being known, did you or do you know who I am? And then we get to this place and say, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, God. And as I was going over, he said, he said, have we come to a place of complacency that being in captivity is our norm? Have we come to a place that that which once was delivered have become our norm? I say, wait, hold on, God. He said, could we once, could that which once we was delivered from become a place to be delivered over and over and over again? He said, if I am a deliverer, why am I delivering you from the same thing over and over and over again? So obviously, I am not known in your life in that way. I said, okay. He said, give this, this example. He said, if, if you have been the one that been victimized, right? It gives the opportunity for us to receive pity as being the victim, all right? And if it's going to give me the opportunity to perceive or to receive pity, I might want to stay in that spot, Shamika. Why? Because it sues something about me being the victim of the thing of that, that victimized me. Now I can actually become a victim to somebody else off of the thing that he was supposed to deliver me from. Because now I continue to use that as my pity party to get my way through. I said, okay. He said, not knowing that I am holding others hostage off of something that he delivered me from. 
how in the world can I hold you hostage of something that God has delivered me from, but I'm using that as a playing field to get my way through, and God is asking me, I was never known as your deliverer if you are still doing that. I say, okay. He says, majority of us, and we all do this, we have a story to tell. Everybody got a story to tell. But God asks me, how long will you give hell a platform in your life? Because if my story can gain a bunch of likes, right? And it can gain a bunch of followers. And I can produce a, a lot of influence. He said that you just gave hell a platform in your life because you're using that in order to get the people to come and to resonate of something that I should have delivered you out of. I said, what? He said, yes, it happened. But how many years are you going to keep putting that on the platform? If I ask you to heal me from it, how in the world do I keep going back to it and say what it done to me if I ask you to heal me for it? So one breath you heal me, the next breath I'm still in captivity. Because what it does, if you ever known, I will not negate nobody's story because we all have a testimony. But when is enough, is enough, is enough that we're able to put God on the platform of, guess what? It happened, I'm delivered, I'm set free, I move on. Now let me tell you what my God is doing at this moment. Yes, we're overcome by our testimony, but do not let our testimony be a plot and scheme to get people to buy into something that we said that our God has delivered us from. And so often, we're so guilty of it because it's something about that place that draws this place of sympathy and empathy for people to hold on to that gives me this, 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 this neurotic or it gives me this fulfillment. And God is saying, why? Why? How can I really be your deliverer if you keep going back to the mess that you asked me to heal you from? I said, okay. He said, if you go to the story of Naomi and Ruth, right? He got me to dig a little bit deeper. And we know about the story of Naomi, but he brought it from a different perspective. Shamika suggested this book to me, and I began to read the book, and I'm just like I think on the third chapter, and I don't have the book for a couple of months, but I'm taking my time with it because I really want to know what is God saying in this moment. So I got an opportunity just to read a couple of pages out of the book, and the, and the writer was talking about Naomi, and he was talking about why they left the place of Bethel. Why her husband and her sons, why they actually left. And as I did my research, it says that Naomi and her husbands and her sons, they left and they moved to Moab because a family was in Bethlehem, right? In Bethlehem. The literal, listen to this, y'all. The literal meaning or the literal meaning in the Hebrew name of their hometown, Bethlehem means house of bread. So it means house of bread, all right? And so I was going to get a loaf of bread, but my husband told me we got some bread at the house, right? <laughs> so, because we don't really eat bread like that. So I brung the Hawaiian bread. I don't know if they was eating Hawaiian bread in the house of the Lord, but I'm just bringing this just an example, all right, y'all? So the house of bread, Bethlehem, the Hebrew meaning of it is the house of bread, right? So in that name, it says that the house of bread means 
The presence of God is in that place. So they left because the presence of God was not in Bethlehem. Why did she perceive that? Because a famine came. They believe God so much that if even anything in the atmosphere shift, that was a, a, a indication that God's presence had left. How many of us <laughs> have come into a place and there is no showbread in the house and people leave because the presence of God have left the building. How many of us can honestly say that we're sitting in a place and the presence of God is dwelling in this place? Or have we come so accustomed to something that resembles the presence of God. Because this is just a resemblance, but this is not the bread that they actually use. And I'm glad I picked the Hawaiian bread now that I think about it. Because Hawaiian bread gives us a sweetness of flavor. I would choose this over a regular loaf of bread, right? Knowing because it will appease my flesh in such a manner that I will mess around. If y'all don't watch me, I eat the whole pack. But this is not what God asked me to bring into the house of God. It was a different type of bread that took time that they had to mash together. It had to be put together. It had to have all the ingredients and it had to be slow cooked on fire. But this is what will take over the real presence of God. Something that will just uh, please us for that moment. I said, hold on. And I think this bread was like $5, y'all. We'll pray. We will pay more money for a counterfeit than, in, than us actually go ahead and getting something that will fulfill us in a place. God said, listen, y'all. Look at, look, look at this bread. Look at Look at this bread. It said the bread was part of the temple practices. It was proof that the presence of God, the show bread, was in the house. This was something historically they've done. And whenever you will go to the temple, that was bread. That was a show bread that was made known, right? And why is that? Because they wanted everybody to know that God's presence was in that place. That if his presence was in, wasn't in that place, they will not go into that temple, right? He said that if we find it in, in the Old Testament, the bread of his presence, it, they even call it the bread of his presence in Numbers. He said that if the bread of his presence is made known, that means that I am in the building, I am in the surrounding, that I approve this message, right? That nobody else but him if his presence was there. And I said, hold on, he said, let's go a little deeper. Whenever y'all do communion, have we come to a place that communion have come such a norm to us? This is just our first Sunday thing. He said that his body, what, is the bread that was broken for us. Do this as much as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me. Meaning that if I can break bread with him every single morning, I am asking his presence to come into my life. But sometimes we use only that moment. That's why I said the moment of God's presence. Is next Sunday the only moment that we're inviting God into this temple? Do we not ask for his bread every single day? He said dig a little bit deeper. When he did talk to the disciples there are father's prayer. What did they open up with? Our father which are in heaven. Okay what? Give us what? Our daily bread. Why? Because he's telling us that you daily are going to need me. What you had yesterday 
will not suffice for today, but I need you to ask me for your daily bread every single day. That I don't want to just be a Thanksgiving part of you. I want every single day for my presence to be known in your life. This is why we're teaching the babies. If you don't know any other scripture, if you don't know any other prayer, learn the Lord's prayer. Why? Because that will guarantee you his presence. That if I wake up in the morning I say, God, give me your daily bread. Why? Because whenever we eat bread, what does it do? It expands. That means that nothing else has room to get in the place of where God's presence is. We need the presence to do what? To expand. That means that every single thing that I am dealing with, God can come in and he can expand himself in my situations, in my circumstances. But if I'm not asking for his presence, if I'm not asking for his daily bread, I give him nothing to work with. He said, is my presence known? Am I known in this place? Am I known in your life? Did you come to a place where for most of us, if you're not a bread eater, what usually happens if you do not eat the bread in a timely manner? It begins to do what? It get hard and it gets stale. And that is usually what happens with the body of Christ because we're still holding on to the bread that was across the street street and that bread is stale and that bread is no good and God said I need you to ask for a fresh batch I need you to ask for me every single day that I'm not just asking for him on Sunday Belinda but I need a Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and Friday and if you have children you need him in the morning in the evening in the noonday and you have siblings and you have spouses you need him 24 hours out of the day that I cannot just suffice for what I get here on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and 1145 but I need him all day long and he's asking am I known in your life and I say, God, I, I need that bread, that bread that you that you that you you talk about. You said that we should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And how do I know that? Because if I'm eating the word of God, if I'm eating the word of God, I'm eating the living water of God, I'm eating the daily bread of God. And then in that moment, everything that I do, everything that I say, how I move should resembles the presence of God I say oh God you giving me a checkup he said he said I took them out of this place so they will know who I am in a new manner I took the Israelites out of Egypt into a wilderness so they will know who I am and then they get into the wilderness and they start to complain and complain and complain how many of us God have brung us from the one bedroom studio apartment to a full house and we're still complaining how many of us have God have delivered us from the who won to a car that will not break down on us and we're still complaining how many of us came from a place to no job to making six figures and we're still complaining how many of us have put God in a place as if he has kept us in captivity he said am I known am I known have you come to a place where you have kept yourself in captivity by holding me hostage of something that I delivered you from already? I said, oh God. He said, 
What I was leading you towards was the things that will prepare you. Because believe it or not, we have to be prepared to go into a promised land. And we can't deal with the stuff in the wilderness. What makes us think that we're going to be able to deal with the stuff in the promised land? If I cannot, if for example, if God has brought me out of the world, right? And I've been in the house of God for a minute of years years, right? And God is changing me, changing my character, changing my, my everything. How in the world can I still be in a place and if somebody don't speak to me, all hell breaks loose? We ask for things that we really may not be ready for. Why do we know that? Because behavior always tell on us. It tell on us every single time. So that is enough proof. You don't have to say anything to me. I can ask, I can look by your behavior and say that we're not ready to go into the promised land. For example, Travis and I, we went to Chicago. We, minute, we visit um, John's Hannah Ministry, right? And I'm looking, I'm like, yeah, we trying to get to this minute. Like, this is the level we want to get in. And as I sat down, I say, God, are we really ready for this level? because this level don't look like the level that is right here. Why? Because there are certain behaviors and characteristics that we have had to groan through in order to deal with the influx of what that promised land looked like. Because in their promised land, crop tops and, and skinny leg jeans and tights is acceptable. What would we do if it walked through our door? Are we ready? What will we do? Will we allow them to enter into a place where transformation can take place or will we stop it at the door because they don't look like what we think they should look if they're coming into the house of the God. But let me remind myself, at one time I came with the short skirts. At one time I came when I was hormone. At one time I came when I was in adultery or sleeping with somebody and now you have the ability to tell me I can't come into a place where transformation has to take place are we ready are we ready we say we want to go to the promised land and the promised land have everything in there that does not look like Christ but God said I will bring them in so that can do the work. It is not you who does the work. I am I known in this place. And I said, and I watch all these people come in and out this out of this ministry, and nobody's face was turned upside down. I had to check myself, like, hold on, God, are you accepting? You know why? Because we're so used to certain things, and we don't understand that when God is doing a new thing, that we have to be okay with what the new thing looks like. It might be stale bread, but as it comes in the presence of God. He will begin to make it. He will begin to mold it. He will begin to shape it. And then we will see the presence of God on the very people that we shunned away. We sat in the ministry and I said, God, we're asking for something that I don't even know if we're really ready for. I don't even know if, if I'm ready for that. I was telling Travis, I'm, I'm so used to being able to touch my pastor. I'm so used to being near him. But what if God saying he gave you enough that you don't have to touch him no more. He poured enough that you ain't got to call him no more. He's done enough where you ain't got to call his phone for prayer. But he has poured in enough that you don't have to touch him because you are in the presence that it hasn't been in, in this atmosphere. We have created a presence where I can be over here and his presence is still known. I can be at the front door and his presence is still known. He's saying, are you and am I known in your life? I 
said, I don't know, God, if I, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready to deal with the millions, right? Because there's no way they can touch that pastor. That means that everybody else have to be their own pastor over their own lives. And then we got to be able to trust the pastors that he put in place. So if he have decreed and declared that Pastor Steve is going to be over this group, this group got to be okay with Pastor Steve being in their lives. And if he have declared that Sierra Minister is over this group, you got to trust that she's okay with this group. Have we come to a place of really realizing what God has given us? He's asking the question, am I known? I get it. We all have failed and fell short of his glory. But so did you and so did me. But God is working on me. As long as I come in the presence, everything will begin to fall off. As long as I come in his presence, everything will begin to change. As long as I come in his presence. Don't tell me that the showbread can't be in this place. But as long as I come in his presence, and for some of us that's, that's, that's made it to that place to be able to coach everybody else, I often hear that it's not my job, it is your job. It's your job. It's your job. Why is it your job? Because if we all in the body of Christ, somebody prayed for me. Somebody talked me off the ledge. Somebody answered that phone for me. Somebody saw about me. So how is it that I can't see about my sister and my brother in Christ? How is it that I cannot deal with or tolerate the things that God delivered me from? Remember, if I had a bad attitude, nine times out of ten, God gonna hook you up with somebody with a bad attitude. Why is that? Because you can show them the way out. times do we abandon our posts? Why? Because we have gotten to a place where we feel like that God has done so much for us. They got to get it on their own. That is not the love of God. He said, am I known? Do they know me? Do they know me? Do they know me? And how do we know that the presence of God is with us? That you can go into any surrounding and they can say out their mouth, I don't know what it is about you. I don't know what it is. But we know that there is the presence of God illuminating. Guess what? I can go into any surrounding with any type of music. And I don't have to second guess myself. I know the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of me. That I've come to a place that I know who my God is. And your situation will not conform me to going back into a place where he's delivered me from. Have we become so holy that we got holes in us? And the holes is everything leaking out of you. That God cannot even use you. He said, Am I known? the question myself Shamika is is he known in me that when I open my mouth I want his presence to be evidence that I belong to him Moses said he said how would they know that I belong to you how would they distinguish me from them how would the world know that we are the body of Christ they said the earth they are moaning and they are groaning for the true worshipers when the true worshipers stand up everything changes nothing stays the same he said am I known do they know me through your praise and through your worship do they know me through the instrument everything that I've given you the ability 
need to do, it should represent me. He said, am I known 